Another round of applause. My name is Jeff Garrison. I am a trans filmmaker, storyteller. My pronouns are he and they. And uh, Courtney Burton, I'd like you guys to introduce yourself in a similar fashion and just a bit of background on um, where you are as a creative and, and who you are as a person. My name is Courtney Herman. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm a professor of film at Portland State University and I'm a documentary filmmaker. And I want to acknowledge quickly my, um, my wife, who's also the co-director of this film, who is out in the audience, Carrie Beth Elliott. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Burton Ford. Um, I uh, am a painter and a musician. I work in a hospital and um, Courtney's best friend for 25 years, I guess. Five years. And my pronouns are he and him and his. So, of course, the friendship that you guys have had forever. Can you talk about your first um, desire in 2004 or five to start kind of working with Burton and filming, you know? So, uh, filmmakers here know that you bother your friends and family constantly to do stuff for you, and uh -huh. that includes when you're a student, making them be in everything. And so Bert was very accustomed to me being like, hey Bert, I need someone to be in this thing I'm making. Um, so it's, I had shot tons of stuff with Burton, and also, being a documentary filmmaker, I had a camera that I would just bring out all the time and just shoot anything that was happening. So I shot a lot of kind of home video. So the camera was kind of always just sort of around and it was always just kind of part of, of our lives sort of. So it was not like a thing where it's like, oh, I want to do something with Bert. It was just sort of automatic. So you were pretty used to Courtney having the camera and following you around or being a part of that. What was I mean, what was she, that process for you? She did it in a really offhand way, and like she said, she'd been recording me like playing guitar and uh, like for years before, and so it, she just kind of would sneak it out, and then it would just be there in the room, and it was a skill. I realize now. Um, <laughs> I didn't at any. I, I thought, well, if she wants to do a documentary on me. It's she's not doing it right, you know, <laughs> because at that time all the documentaries were like less personal moments, more like, uh, I don't know, kind of a little awkward and very, uh, people have said it better than I'm going to say it, but very focused on physical transition. And this was much more um, friendly and casual. I mean, the title kind of plays on that, which an audience member brought up, that it's you know, I was not setting out, so we didn't even know why we were shooting that at the time, it just was part of life. Um, but I didn't want to set out to make uh, a makeover piece, and so I thought just sort of playing on that, like it's a before and after in a completely different way that is not, it's like, it's so, somewhat related to a physical transition, but not really. Well, we were talking earlier before the panel about the fact that we both have backgrounds in you know, academia, and filmmaking, and documentary. And looking at back then and, and representation, and this keeps coming up, right? Visibility matters, representation matter, matters, and who is telling the stories matters 100%. In this situation, you know, you have somebody who is telling somebody else's story, but you're not exactly other. You're a part of that relationship and that friendship and, and the access. And also, I, I feel like the care that you have for Burton as a friend first to me comes across more than just as a quote unquote subject. Right, and I wanna, I wanna be clear that I don't think that filmmakers should only be allowed to make films about their best friend. <laughs> I think that there's a lot to be said about people um, instead maybe being in collaboration with one another. So it's not just about like, you have to come from the community to make the piece or you can't do it. I think it's more about collaboration and and this film in particular because of the way that it's 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 done it pulls back the curtain on process so you can actually see the collaboration taking place which is like hey i've got this idea and it's like i don't want to do it and it's like okay you know <laughs> um and even in the beginning where it was like wow this is a lot and he got teary-eyed and i'm like excited you know, he's, he's watching this the first time in right, 15 years. Like, I'm like, yeah, this is great. and then i look over and he's crying i'm like oh should we go on 
And he's like, yeah, I'm like, okay. Uh, so I'll move on. But you know, just to kind of, I, I think the point is, is to that that this shows a, the, the, the collaborative spirit that I believe as a documentary filmmaker that I use in working with collaborators um, rather than addressing a subject or making a film about someone. And Burton, to that, to that point, did you feel included, heard, and part of the process? Like in the original uh, footage or the later, like the oh, actual? Both either. I definitely felt included and heard, and um, Courtney made it clear along, because I was really hesitant for my own safety in this certain section of my life. Um, Courtney made it clear along the whole way, you know, we can not, that basically I had the, the power to stop it from going anywhere. Yeah, when, when Lucy sent me this film uh, earlier to, to talk about, you know, doing this today, that really resonated with me, that moment where you were vulnerable and said that I, I'm concerned, right? I'm concerned for my, my job, my safety. We talk about visibility and also we were talking earlier about you know, this notion of, of um, trans masculine, trans male invisibility from the, the media that is out there and various reasons why, you know, sometimes um, trans men are able to be a little more stealth than some of our trans sisters and there is that dialogue or debate within us of how much we take advantage of that privilege and how much we need to be advocates, not just for ourselves, but but the trans community. We were talking this earlier about doing the work, right? and. And you know the the um, the fact that sometimes that wears us out in being visible, but also it's also necessary. So can you speak more to the decision you made to participate in this? Because you had to make that decision. Um. Well, you know I've been pretty much freaking out for the last year and a half about the election, and everything seems to be getting really bad and I think I just I kind of lost my ability, it just was like a circuit breaker, just flipped. I lost my ability to protect myself, especially in the um, in light of the knowledge that so many other people are not protected at all. And um, it's, mm, my safety doesn't, in this certain way, my comfort at work that because I work around toxic people, um, it doesn't matter to me as much anymore. It just doesn't seem to be, it was something I had the privilege to protect, and I don't, we're way past that. Yes, yes, applause for that. Why did you decide, Courtney, to revisit it? Like, what was that about for yourself? I saw the Diane Sawyer interview with Caitlyn Jenner, and I thought, that's one story. <laughs> and then I'm like, I can't identify with that story at all. Um, and then I, I, I thought, well, well, actually I was cleaning out my office space, and you know, we used to shoot on tapes. And so there's tapes like littering my life. And so these particular tapes, I thought, I'll, I'll digitize these, make these into digital files, and then I can get rid of the tapes. And I remember shooting some stuff with Burton in the, in the, back then, um, but I didn't realize how much we actually shot. There were about six hours that we had shot total over the course of a few years, starting in, um, was it 2002? And going, to, going for like three or four years after that. Um, and then, so th I thought, this is kind of interesting. I wonder what Burton would think of this. I totally have to show him this. But it was also intensely boring because there, were, there was a lot of footage of like us sitting on the couch, like smoking bowls and stuff. It was really <laughs> silly. Um, some, and there was no point in us sitting through that. Um, and so my, my partner, Carrie Beth, edited it down to like an hour. And then I invited him to like, let's sit down and let's shoot the reactions. I don't know why I thought a film about two people sitting on a couch would be interesting, but I thought, why not, you know? Um, because I thought that it would be, let's, let's make a little film that has, that, where there's another, yet another story that we can add to the mix of stories that we need about the queer community. Um, and so, yeah, and so I invited him, and I, we, we shot that because I thought he might say no, and indeed, he, he, you know, he did. We were also talking before the panel about this responsibility of a filmmaker when you're making queer content or trans content 
and you know who your audience is, right? We're talking about the audience and what our jobs or what is not our job to try to explain and at what point do we ask our audience to bring some work to the table, yeah. to do some research, to, uh -huh. to not have to have it all spelled out. Uh -huh. and, and a, right? That's right. Yeah. And aside from this film particularly, but because, you know, I'm sitting here with a film professor, um, you know, some of your take on that as a queer maker. Well, I mean, the first thing I think is that um, you, have to, you have to have a target audience and people like to say, like, my film's for everyone. And that's so nice. And that's really, like, unrealistic, I think. Um, because there will be certain people who will be more interested in what you're doing. And you have to sort of understand who those people are. And one thing you have to ask yourself as a documentary filmmaker is, what can I assume that this audience will know? And what will they not know? Um, and so while I do think it's true that this particular film can be comprehended, understood by a more general audience, mainly because of the letter Burton wrote to his parents, which is writing to sort of the people who don't have experience with, with queer communities, that it is accessible, I think, in that way, but, but it is a, a film about the queer experience for a queer audience made by queer people, first and foremost. And I think that that's a little bit different than films made where there's a subject and the filmmaker is not necessarily a part of the queer community and they're having to explain all these things and they start out with like medical diagnoses, which is like sort of part of this, which is funny because we don't really use those terms anymore. Um, so, but I do think it's important to, to, to know who your audience is and to, to serve the, that group first and give them the information that they need. And at the same time, as we heard earlier, you know, give zero fucks and get people to get on board. And I think that they, and here, and this doesn't apologize, I, I don't think. I think it's like, here we are, and you gotta love us, you know, and if you don't, something's wrong with you, because look at us, we're just people, you know. Um, so I do think in that way, it's a zero fucks proposition, which is, um, this is a personal narrative, and I think personal narrative is a really great way to address um, issues of, of political and social importance in this moment, where rhetoric, I believe, fails. Yes. Right, right. Yes. And it's, it's such a, you know, when I, when Lucy sent that to me and I was watching it at home on my computer and, you know, I, I did cry. Like, I had those tears. I shared the tears with you, Burton, and even sitting here again, I'm like, oh my God, it's happening again. You I know, know, I just cried too. <laughs> I've only seen it like four times, so... And I thought my new testosterone was supposed to get rid of that. It <laughs> um, but I think that there is, there is, you know, I think any young person who is wanting to get facial hair, or any person like myself in my puberty in my 40s wanting or not wanting facial hair, you know, is that we have an access point. So to speak to your, you know, notion of it's for everybody or it's not, there are still some universal truths that we can connect to. And, um, and, and, and a documentary film that this is a very small in scope project but it's very layered and it hits on a lot of meta themes so how how did you approach that as you were deciding what you were going to include in this version um i think that documentary does a really great job of making the familiar feel new and making the unfamiliar feel familiar and it's i think that it that you just kind of let it happen um, this isn't an explainer video, um, it's a movie, and, um, and so I think that if you are, I, I, and I also believe that through the particular, we have access to the universal. I mean, you can't just sort of get at the universal just by like jumping onto it. It's, it's, you access it only through specific particular stories in, right. in this case. Mm -hmm. And so in that kernel of the particular lives the whole universe, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, so I think that if I, I kind of felt like we'll just be us and that's so relatable. Absolutely. I think it comes across <laughs> Burton giving you side eye. <laughs> I wanted to um, give some time to the audience to ask some questions. So uh, if anybody has a question, if you want to raise your hand. Yes, right in the center. I'm a medical equipment repair technician in a hospital um, in Oregon, so I fix all of the respiratory machines and calibrate them. So then I guess I wanted to ask about what your experience has been like um, post, post uh, coming out 
to everyone and what that process in particular was like? Was, was it like something where you kind of sent out a message to everyone you worked with, or did you work through HR, or what exactly did you do to navigate that process? As I'm going through that process myself this year. Um, I started this job after, um, so I was working as a bicycle mechanic when I was physically transitioning. Her. And um, I, I'm not out to the people that I work with. They're um, not very nice people. And um, the hospital in general is incredibly uh, LGBT friendly and very forward in their approach. Um, the particular job that I have just seems to lend itself towards a type of human that doesn't have a very large heart. No. I don't know why <laughs> this is, um, this is the case, but it's changing. And um, so, and I'm not, I'm not like stealth or closeted in any way to anybody else in my city or anyone in the floors above me, but these particular people, I, to, in order to sort of protect my safety and the day to day and my functionality, um, I'm not out, so. We, Bert ran into somebody who we worked with at the airport on our way here yesterday and um, the guy was like, oh, where are you going? And Bert's like, LA. And the guy said so where he's going. Well, and they parted ways and the guy was like, well, have fun at your big premiere. And the guy didn't know. And so it was like, he sort of like weirdly, and, and Bert's like, thanks, I will. You know, it was like this strange thing that took place. So there's some serious code switching for you. Yeah, I definitely lead like at this weird double life. And I actually, it's, I kind of, I admit that I started to have fun with it because there's so much that you can say that will fly beneath the radar of people who would never, who just have no, like, just, they just lead very, very, I don't want to say small, but, um, it's small lives. <laughs> yes, the question. Yes, right, Mr. I was just wondering what part of the world they may have come from. Was it, are they Oregonian? Or are they from another part of the state or country? Um, they're Philadelphians. Philadelphian? <laughs> through and through, all the way back um, to a certain point. And um, unfortunately, they, we had a good couple of years and we got closer and, and we spent some time together. But um, over the past year and a half, Actually, we just our relationship just severed a couple of days ago completely oh, over sorry. their support for this president. Wow. So oh. it's a sad story. I didn't want to bring it up, but maybe it'll change later. Oh, but, but that's real. We're all having these conversations. You know, I'm I'm from Texas. I'm from Austin, but my, my <laughs> but fa family family from Texas and and. You know, Texas is one of those 13 states where, um, you know, you're, it is not illegal to deny trans health care for employees and, and there is no um, anti-discrimination laws on the books, you know, and I think sometimes when we live in communities like Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York, we, we, we forget about that, right? Not only there's privilege on multiple levels, but just that, that basic fundamental, you know, human rights that we forget that not everybody living in other states you know, has, has access to um, what we have access to, and it's still a, a struggle when we have access to it. Other questions? Yes, Senator Blackshirt. Uh, because it's not a question, I just want to say that uh, thank you for doing this project, because one thing that was really nice was seeing a trans guy who's been many, many years through transition, at least something as a younger trans guy, it's really hard for me to find older trans men who are just living their lives, and not only that, but who are able to look back and say, here's where I've been, here's what the process has been like. And so it's really wonderful to get a fuller sense of transition that is not simply young trans guy who is out and out and suddenly stealth and doesn't want to speak about it. So that was really brave, and you know, is, I don't know how much older you are than no. I, but thank you. I'm, I'm 46. I'm 29. <laughs> we represent the trans pause up here. <laughs> so, other question? Yes, in the back.
I mean, the, I mean the, this question has been posed to you, Bert. Do you remember the, the process? Because it was actually like, what I do is I text Bert and I'm like, can we put in the part about blah, blah, blah? He's like, yeah, well, whatever you guys want to do. And I'm like, <laughs> I, so I text again. We're thinking about putting in the part about blah, blah, blah. He's like, okay. And I was like, okay, all right. And, and so, I mean, the, the fact is, is that if you have the camera and you have the editing system, you have all of the power. Yeah, that's true. All of it. And that never changes. And if you don't like the fact, as a documentary filmmaker, that you're using somebody else's story, you're exploiting someone else's story right. to make your art, uh -huh. you can't do it anymore. Uh -huh. Because that's what it always is, no matter what. Uh -huh. I mean, all I can say about it is that Burton super trusts me only because we've known each other for 25 years, but not just that, but we were like a couple for the first five of the, I mean, we've been hey. through a lot of shit. Like we met when we were 20 and then there was like five or six years of like what that looks like, you know, <laughs> and then, and so, yeah, so like it was me constantly saying, okay, then showing it to him and being like, Okay, what do you think? You know, and and Burton's like, yeah, it's great. And it's like, okay, we're gonna. Makes me sound really passive. I know, but it's and it's, and he's not. He's not. But it's just that he's just trusted us to do this. And also, he's been in so much stuff that we've done that it's just another thing. I think in some ways, although it's you know more, much more intimate, and personal. I mean, I didn't feel rolled at any point. Um, I, I feel like I had the, the power to say actually. I'm sorry, you know, but I can't have this be go out into the world because I'm, I, I think I had that power to say no. Um, I was only reticent about um, the part where I used the word tranny because I didn't want to hurt people. Mm -hmm. And although I, you know, was clearly mortified with the fact that I had been using that word and thinking of myself that way, and stopped, um, I just, I was still really, I was concerned about um, hurting people's feelings, so. Yeah, we were, we were scared, we were, yeah, we were afraid of the younger generation, that they would hate this, and that they would think that we were, like, boring and not relevant, and that, and the tranny word, we went over it and over it, and then we showed it to a test audience at Evergreen State College in Washington, which I feel like is probably the, maybe the, if you know that college, we figured they, if they're gonna like hate us for this, you know, then that's like the ultimate test. And if they're not, then I think we'll be okay. Um, but people aren't gonna like that. But we just decided to keep it in because that's the the language has updated. It will always update. Yeah. The way that we talk right now, uh -huh. in ten years, we're not gonna speak that way anymore. Right. It's gonna be something else. And so we just kind of have to own that. That's what, historically, that's the way we we're talking. And obviously, from our point of view now, we were, like, laughing at it because that's what you do when, you're, when you hear yourself saying something embarrassing <laughs> as on videotape. Well, I, you know, and, and knowing, you know, and, and how, what it takes to make a documentary, and then when I first saw that, I was like, ooh. And then the reaction, like, uh, this filmmaker deliberately left that in there for a reason. And your reaction is like, we didn't have to, like, you know, smack your wrist for it. You kind of recognize it in that very sweet way of going, oh, class, you know, it just, it resonated, it's like you knew, you know, how, how you've learned and how we're all learning and we're all hopefully, when we make those mistakes and we'll continue to make those mistakes and we try to not make the same mistakes and say, I'll do better. And I think that's what we're all trying to do, as we said earlier, like we're all trying to do better and learn from one another. And that's what this whole summit is about. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, in the back. Yes. Yeah, I mean, right. Well, I mean, the trans pain narrative is not something, I mean, that's a thing. The makeover film, that's a thing. The inspirational film intended for straight audiences, you know, this poor person was born into the wrong body. Oh my God. Um, so it's, you know, I don't think we, that, 
I mean, there, there's pain, and let's make films about that too. But um, I don't think that this is a, a less of a story because it doesn't depict the pain. And we didn't make an effort to specifically say this is not about the trans pain. This is not the trans pain narrative. Um, it just was the story. And so, but we, all, I also felt like what happened for me when I was reviewing the footage, I, I, I watched the letter being read and I thought, there's a trans kid out there that should take this down verbatim, yes. update the language, personalize it, and just send that to their parents. Yeah. Because, and I thought we have to, you know, maybe this is something we should bring, bring forward. I mean, we couldn't even have that question if we didn't have people that were, you had to start somewhere to create some stories, to get some visibility and media out there. I mean, there aren't enough stories. I mean, that's what we all are talking about here, is that we need to just keep making it. We need those gatekeepers and those people that have right. the funding to, to start giving us the access to tell more of these stories. Because Burton's experience, my experience, your experience, they're only our experiences, and we can't be the person who is speaking for everybody that falls within the trans umbrella. That's just not possible. Queer multiplicity. We're more than one thing. Well, thank you both so much for thank sharing you. the film, sharing your work. I'm uh, looking forward to more.